as none of us want to waste our precious vacation time and money on anything but those cruise lines on top of their game, I've been diving into the latest cruise reviews, poring over the thousands of comments and messages I get, and I've been cruising on many cruise lines recently to see which are hot and which are not right now. Now, based on all of that, here are the lines I think you may need to think about carefully and why. First off, I found there's a pretty rocky storm at sea right now, driving many passenger frustrations. First of all, many lines are cutting back. They're charging for things that used to be included and at the same time, increasing charges. Secondly, ships are sailing fuller than ever before in many regions because demand is high and it's stretching the crew and testing passengers' patience because of all the lines and people. Thirdly, cruise lines are obsessed with attracting new to cruise passengers, including families. They're making that really clear and they're making their ships and everything they do more appealing to those. So on some lines, as you'll see when I discuss it, existing cruises are seeing changes that don't really appeal. I certainly am. And fourthly, almost all lines now have bigger ships post shutdown, both from selling of smaller ones and launching all the new ships, which is changing the experience on many established lines dramatically, as you will see. By the way, if you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and I make it fun and easy to discover, plan, and enjoy incredible cruise vacations. Here are the seven cruise lines, that's right, seven, that I'm seeing or personally have a lot of grumbles about. Let me start with those in the mass resort lines first. The cruise line that gets lots of the grumbles is Costa Cruise Lines. Of course, many uh, English speaking travelers are not really actively looking at Costa Cruise Lines because you know it's an Italian centric line and so it's not on many people's radars. However, because Carnival Corporation, which owns them, they've moved two of their ships, uh, Venezia and Firenze, to sail under the Carnival name as kind of carnival fun Italian style concepts out of the USA. So many people are reassessing Costa and actually trying the original line. However, on that main Costa line, most English speaking passengers found it a bit alien uh, because once on board, they found they were in the minority, the lead language and all activities, announcements and so on is in Italian. And also because most passengers are, you know, that they're meeting and mixing with are Italian, it's becoming much more difficult. It also tends to attract families with younger kids. The food is so-so because it's a value line, you know, get really good fares. There are many more smokers, generally speaking. And although its newer ships are modern up to date, it really is a line that just doesn't seem to resonate with travelers used to a much more American or British style of cruising. And we're seeing that in re the reviews, which is why it has some of the lowest ratings of any cruise line of any grade because of you know most English speaking travelers finding it a little bit alien. So one to be careful of. The next, which is also rated really low right now for many of the same reasons is MSC Cruises. However, MSC Cruises are making a big push into many regions beyond the European base, including the UK, where they have ships like MSC Virtuosa, and in North America, where they're selling out of Miami, particularly with many of their big, new, glitzy mega ships. Now, many travelers, uh, English speaking travelers, certainly have tried MSC Cruises because of their incredibly good value. They have a policy where kids travel free, which makes it extremely appealing to families. But many, once on board, have not really liked the experience. Now, MSC Cruises gets criticism for a couple of reasons. First of all, they tend to be really packed, partly driven by the kids traveling free rule. So many cabins, certainly in vacation time, will have four or five people in it. You know, so for example, on my MSC Virtuoso cruise earlier this year, the sailing after we, which was entering the school holidays, had 6,000 people on board versus the double occupancy of 4,500 that I had, which already was feeling crowded. So that 1,500 additional passengers were all kids. So this has then a knock-on effect leading to customer service tended to be pretty poor and offhand, long lines for events, long waiting times to get served with drinks, especially restaurants and shows, you know, often booked out at all the popular times. And even it can be quite, you know, hard to find places to sit in the evenings in the bars, which is kind of a knock on effect of being so busy. Now, as the service and approach is more European too, I think that's why we see many, particularly North American guests, 
find and criticize the service of being a little bit more aloof, less engaging, less bubbly versus more US centric lines. So there's a kind of a difference in philosophy there. The food overall gets rated at best as okay. I found it not particularly amazing. It's okay, particularly for the fare. Now they do have the Yacht Club, which is their more premium ship within a ship with dedicated concierge, a lounge, bar, deck, and, and a restaurant. Now this gets better ratings because it's probably the best value suites in the category, probably. The ships themselves get good reviews for being very beautiful, uh, but, you know, and people aren't paying a lot of money. So critics are perhaps not factoring in kind of the value for money so much, uh, which is why it gets rated much lower. But it is a line overall that passengers rate low, so proceed with caution. Another cruise line I need to mention, which is an absolute juggernaut, and the biggest cruise line in terms of number of passengers carried, is Carnival. Now Carnival is getting very mixed reviews at the moment and I did debate whether to include it in this list because I suspect there is a different reason for the poor reviews at this particular time. Now these are big fun ships, they're boisterous, they're rowdy and they are for people who want to have a great party, a buzzing atmosphere. They have a really loyal following who absolutely adore all of that. And so looking at the critics, I felt that most of the poor reviews are from passengers that are probably going on the line, but it's not best suited for them. Because a lot of the criticisms are around the ships being too busy, too boisterous, too rowdy, uh, you know, the entertainment program not being what they're looking for, uh, overall people, though do like the value, they like the food, they like the service, they love the newer ships like the Mardi Gras. So I have included Carnival in my list because I think it reminds all of us and including me that going on a cruise line that is right for us, even if a line like Carnival is a cheaper option, it's really essential to choose the right cruise line when picking our cruise and I think that's why we're seeing uh, mixed reviews at the moment. I was also surprised to see Norwegian Cruise Line, which generally has really good reviews, getting fewer good reviews at the moment. Now this seems, I think, to be mostly focused on three issues that are really annoying passengers right now. First, they have made some very public cuts in service, like moving to once a day cabin service and cutting the numbers of cabin stewards, all at the same time while increasing gratuities. They've also started to cut back on some of the production shows that they are known and loved for. So they've, cut, they've actually cut seven of the big well-known kind of brand Broadway shows on nine of the ships, including shows like Six, Footloose, Kinky Boots, so something that they were really known and loved for. Secondly, they seem to be getting more criticism for nickel and diming than ever before. But Norwegian though has always been a line that has charged for the many choices. They give you lots of choices and everything, you kind of have an extra charge. So that reaction could be you know, more a reaction to some of the public cutbacks. So people are just noticing it and focusing on, on a whole thing much more. The third reason, I think, particularly with the introduction of new ships Prima and Viva, I'm seeing lots of critics complain about the amount of space taken up by the Haven, which is their premium suite only area, you know, restaurant, pool deck, lounge, and so on, only for people in the Haven. And this means it closes increasingly larger parts of these ships to regular guests. So there's much more criticism of Norwegian at the moment, which, which may even out as some of these changes kind of bed in. But bear in mind, very mixed reviews on Norwegian at the moment. Cruise line closer to my home that's getting a very poor rap these days is P&O Cruises. I must admit, this is a line I find not great generally speaking, at the moment. Now, I think a lot of the criticism and poor ratings, including mine though, is partly because this is a cruise line that's actively changing from being a very traditional cruise line focused on couples over 50 with very formal nights, very classic daily program, and they're evolving into a mega ship with more family kind of cruise line approach. It's really shifting its focus into attracting families. It's also you know, much more confusing as a line. It's much less consistent, which I think is fueling these very mixed and poor reviews. It's got a wide range of ships, ranging from these very large modern Iona, uh, Avia, which is the same, ship as, the same ships as Carnival Mardi Gras, to much smaller ships like Aurora and Arcadia, which are you know, smaller adult-only ships. It has very different entertainment, very different venues, very different daily program. 
So I think looking at it, a big part of the complaint is people who used to love Pinot for what it was, you know, couples, very classic, lots of dressing up. They're not enjoying it because it's becoming something very different. Now, first time cruisers and families, like in fact, my own sister-in-law who went on the first time cruising on Pinot was way more enthusiastic about it. So again, if you're considering Pinot, check if the evolving line and Pinot is right for you. Which brings me to another well-known line that seems to be suffering from the same issues. Princess Cruises is a line that I personally have not been that positive about in the last couple of years because I think it's lost a lot of momentum, particularly in relation to the food, which is, I think, not really up to speed. And again, looking at the reviews, we see that. However, they are definitely making changes. They've introduced a new culinary council led by Rudy Soderman, who reinvigorated with great success Holland America food over the last couple of years. Now, Princess is getting very, very mixed reviews for two other reasons, though. First of all, they've taken many things that were included in the base fare to now paid for in their Princess Plus add-ons. And this can cost from $75, £50 a day and upwards. So things like the amazing previously included pizzas you now have to pay for unless you buy the Princess Plus. Other things like you know certain desserts, ordering drinks and snacks where you're based, sitting and so on. You now have to pay for all of that uh, with an add-on. The second reason they're getting poor reviews is I think probably the same issue as Pinot Cruises. They're going down a similar path. They're launching way bigger ships like Sky Princess, Discovery Princess, and these have 3,600 or more passengers. They're getting rid that or got rid of many of their smaller ships during the pandemic. So again, it's a very different experience. And with that, they are focusing on attracting more families, more new to cruise. So for the traditional princess traveler, these are really big changes, which is why I think we've seen some of those more negative reviews because it's evolving from what people knew and loved. However, if you look at the reviews from multi-generational travelers and families, we are seeing a much more positive situation. So again, something to consider if you're thinking of Princess, which of those camps do you fall in? One of the cruise lines that I do have to put in here, as it is getting very mixed to poor reviews now, but I think will improve, is Azamara. Azamara was sold during the cruise shut down by Royal Caribbean and its new owners clearly struggled uh, you know, quite a bit when it first came back up and, and running again. I went on Azamara not long after cruising started up with the new owners and it was very under par versus what it used to be. It was not really performing as it was. There were cutbacks, food was okay, service very mixed. Then they have had many issues with their IT as they shifted onto their own systems with lots of things going wrong from that, you know, you know if you'd booked excursions and other add-ons, it wasn't showing up on board and so on. Lots of kind of errors were kind of thrown up. So it was a little bit chaotic. However, although it's got a lot of negative reviews, it does, I think, seem to be on the change. So I'm seeing more and more kind of positive reviews. So it's definitely one to keep watching because it could be that they're finding their feet, but certainly at the moment, it's very mixed. Those are the ones not doing so well. If you'd like to know which lines are sailing high and getting really strong reviews, then join me over in this video where I start with a line that has beaten all the doomsayers to be among the best right now, much to many people's surprise, including mine. See you over there.